All right, say this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless these people next to me with your wisdom, with your direction for their life. I bind in the name of Jesus every attack, every lie, every hindrance that is in their way. And I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that they are free to follow you and to serve you in the name of Jesus. And no weapon that is formed against my friend will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, we're going to do the next thing. Amen. Give Jesus a hand. Yeah. Now we're going to do the next thing God spoke to us. We're going to love each other. That was so funny. I said that, and some of you went. Some of you are so starved for love. I mean, it's like you never have anybody tell you anything nice. You know? So we're going to love each other. I want everyone to stand up. I want you to turn around, shake someone's hand, put your arm around somebody, pat them on the back, tell them, I love you in Jesus. I love you in Jesus. No kissing, no kissing. <laughs> Got some male bonding going on here. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we don't get it enough. We don't love each other enough. We don't tell each other enough. Sometimes we're just afraid of that word for some reason because of the commitment that goes along with it. All right, you got your Bible. <laughs> Hallelujah. Get your Bible, open it up. To Galatians chapter 3, Galatians, 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 Galatians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, look on with somebody else. Galatians chapter 3. Now in the mornings here, in the mornings we're talking about what we're set free from. What did we talk about what we're set free from yesterday morning? From fear. We're set free from fear. We don't have to be afraid or intimidated. And then the night services, we're talking about what we're set free for. We found out last night we were set free so that we could go share the word with other people, see the Holy Ghost move, and see healings and miracles happen through our hands. This morning, we're going to talk about being set free from the curse, being set free from the curse. Now there is the curse, and there are curses, and then there is cursing. And we're going to touch on all these different areas just a little bit here this morning, but we're going to start here in Galatians chapter 3, and we'll begin in uh, verse 10, Galatians 3.10. If you're taking notes, write that down. You might want to even put a little mark in your Bible next to Galatians uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. That's what we're going to read right now. Here we go. For as many, listen, if you don't have a Bible and you're not following along, then just listen because you need to get the word in your heart. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now I also want you to take your Bible and go over to Deuteronomy chapter 21 in the Old Testament and I want us to look at uh, 
this quote that they take in Galatians out of the Old Testament because we want to go back and see where this is coming from. Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book of the Bible toward the beginning. Chapter 21, Deuteronomy 21, we'll start in verse 22. Deuteronomy chapter 21, we're going to start reading in verse, uh, we'll start in verse 22 here. Or no, where am I? Yeah, 22. It says this, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. There's the verse right there that Paul quotes in Galatians, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, here's what happened. Jesus came to earth, took on the form of a man, and whatever we deserve, that's what he took upon himself to pay the penalty for what you and I not only did, but would ever do that would be counted as sin. And not just that, but it went way beyond that. He paid for the sin nature of man. See, when Adam and Eve sinned, it started a sin cycle into mankind. And when you were born, you were born a sinner. When your parents had you, came out, oh, what a nice baby sinner. You know, there you were. All of us were born sinners. Why? Because we were born into the human race. The only remedy for that is to receive what Jesus had done for us. He took our place. He took our place. Now, most of you know that basically in your head, but I don't know if you know the whole of it. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. There was a reason and a purpose that Jesus hung on a cross, on a tree. There was a purpose for that. He did that to take upon himself the curse. See, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, because cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He took the curse upon himself, not just so you could go to heaven, but so that you would not have to live under that curse. It's one thing to have a promise that when you die, you've got somewhere to go. That's nice. But it meant much more than that. He wanted to redeem you from the curse of the law so that day after day after day after day, you wouldn't have to live under the same problems that the world lives under, the people that don't have him. Now, you're in Deuteronomy. I want you to turn over to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28. Remember in Galatians, he said uh, that there was, an, there was another quote there, and the quote is talking about this particular passage of Scripture. The quote was, Cursed is he who does not continue in all the words of this law to do them. In other words, uh, this in Deuteronomy chapter 8, well, let's, let's read some of it, and, and you'll get the idea. Starting in verse 1, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now, there's some ifs in there. Remember, we talked about ifs the other night. They're conditional. If you do this, God will do this. And these words are true. And it goes through these blessings. I love this verse, too. These blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. Have any of you, when you were in elementary school, you ever play a tag or catch or anything like that? You remember you, you chase the girls around the monkey bars, and when you catch one, you put them in the monkey bars, and they have to stay there. So one of the other girls comes and breaks them out. Oh, that was fun. Me and my wife do that now. You know, it's fun. It's neat. No, we don't. 
We don't have any monkey bars. Anyway, these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. And what this means is they're going to chase you down and jump on your head and make you be blessed. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Can you imagine a million dollars chasing you down the street? What would you do if you knew a million dollars were chasing you down the street? I would stop, <laughs> turn around, let it run over me. But there's some big ifs here. If, 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 if. If you diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. If you obey all of his commandments. Now, how many of you have obeyed all of his commandments? Raise your hand. You just broke one. You lied. <laughs> you went, oh. You only heard the raise your hand part. God wants us to live by faith. In other words, here's the faith. No matter where we're at in our walk with Jesus, we're still looking to him for everything. See? How many of you have blown it in the last week? You made a mistake, you did something wrong in the last week. See? But you've got Jesus. So you do something wrong and you can go to him. Does that give us a license to do stuff that's wrong? No, but we're growing. See, I have two boys. They're here at the camp, Jesse and Ryan. I love them. They're the neatest little guys in the whole world. They're smart. They're talented. I mean, Ryan's written two books. He's working on his third book. He's nine. Jesse, we're driving around in the car the other day. He goes, Dad, I need to invest in mutual funds. He's 11. He has some mutual funds. He has a business. He's making money. I mean, my kids, I'm really proud of them. They're neat. Do my kids ever make mistakes? Yeah. But I mean, when they're little kids, they come in the house and they trip over the lamp cord and the lamp falls down and breaks. Do I kick them out of the house? No. Some of you said, yes, I'd like to meet your parents. <laughs> Why? Because I have a relationship with them. And they can come to me and they can say, you know, Dad, I'm sorry. I'm and I said, don't worry, it's okay. You know, we'll just clean up the mess. And everything's okay. Now, that's the kind of relationship we have with God. We're growing. Now, there comes a point where you're going to have to become responsible for yourself in your Christian walk, responsible for what you do and where you're at. See? But we're not under the curse of the law. In other words, if we blow it, if we do something wrong, see, look at this. In the same chapter, it outlines all these blessings in the first 14 verses. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the field. You'll be blessed in everything that you do. You'll be blessed if you do everything he wants you to do. And then it says in verse 15, look at verse 15, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. You'll be cursed in the city. You'll be cursed in the country. You'll be cursed in your basket and in your kneading bowl. You'll be cursed in the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. And if you, if you look, okay, it starts in verse 15. If you look, there's 68 verses in this chapter. In other words, there's more than twice as many curses than there are blessings. I want you to look. I was reading through some of these last night. Look at verse 64, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. This is so sad. This is the end of the curses. Verse 64, if you don't obey the Lord your God, this is what happens. Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there you will serve other gods which neither you know or your fathers have known of wood and stone, and among those nations you will find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. Thank you. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. In the morning you shall say, oh, that it were evening. And at evening you shall say, oh, that it were morning. This is pitiful. Oh, uh, because of the fear which terrifies your heart and because of the sight which your eyes see, and the Lord will take you back to Egypt in ships by the way of which I said to you, and you shall never see it again. And there you will be offered for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. That's pitiful. Talk about rejection. You're a slave and no one will buy you. I mean, we thought we had it bad, you know? 
And here's these curses. Guess what? Christ has redeemed us from these curses. This is the curse of the law. If you don't obey the law, these are the curses, but Christ has redeemed you from them. In other words, when he hung on that cross, he took upon himself every disobedience, every sin, everything you've ever done wrong, everything you'll ever do wrong, and not only you, but every man, woman, and child that ever graced the face of the earth. He took it all upon himself. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine going before the principal of your school and say, Mr. Principal, it's my fault. Anything and everything that ever happens at this school, every problem, every lie, every, every uh, rebellious word from a student, I take all the responsibility of it upon myself. Pretty heavy, huh? The principal says, okay, then you need to take the punishment for every wrongdoing that has ever happened at this school. Good gracious. Probably send you to prison, you know, if you had to pay for all of that. Well, that's just one school. Think about what it must have been like to take upon yourself everything every human being has ever done or will ever do. All the sin of the world. He took it upon himself. He became a curse so that you could be free. Christ now, I like the way that this puts this in Galatians chapter 3. It says, Christ has redeemed us. What does that mean? It's already been done. It's already done. You don't have to do anything to make it happen. You don't have to, to walk around worrying about trying to keep all the law and all the commandments when you look to him. You look to him. You say, Jesus, you became that curse for me. I am free from the curse and you don't have to live under that curse any longer. Now, I believe because uh, he redeemed us from the curse of the law, he also redeemed us from curses. My wife and I, we lived in Dallas for a couple of years and then we decided to move to Tyler, Texas. And we had learned a lot about the word and how it works. And uh, we were really excited about you know, learning some scriptures like, uh, you know, over in Isaiah where it says, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that rises against you in judgment is condemned already. Where is that? Isaiah 50, 54, 17. There it is. No weapon, you ought to write this down. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. This is Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Now, it's talking about two things, weapons and tongues. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper, and every tongue that rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. And these two work together. Cindy and I were driving down the road one day, and she goes, man, will you pray for me, Spencer? I have, the, I have an awful headache. So I reached my hand over, put my hand on her head, and I said, in the name of Jesus, headache, go, right now. I said, and when I pray, you know, these signs shall follow them that believe. They'll lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I expected her to begin recovering right there. She said, man, it still hurts. So I said, well, let's pray in the Spirit for a little bit. So we began to pray. We were praying. And um, she said, you know what? I said, what? She says, I feel like somebody's talking about me. We were praying in the Spirit. See, when you pray in tongues, when you pray in the Spirit, God will start showing you things. He'll show you things that are going on that you don't know. We were praying in the Spirit. She says, I feel like someone's talking about me. So we took hold of this verse. It says, every tongue that rises against us in judgment, we can condemn. In other words, we can stop it. So we took a minute right there, and we said, we bind every word that's being spoken against Cindy right now, and the headache left just like that. It was gone. Then the headache started coming back. And we bound those words again, and it left. Then it started coming back. And we bound the words spoken against her by somebody, and it left. I don't know. Someone must have been talking about her all day long. Now, I heard a lady speak one time, and I thought it was kind of interesting. She had an opportunity to talk to a couple of witches who uh, their hobby 
the thing that they did for fun was go to church on Sunday mornings and stand in the lobby and listen to the Christians talk about each other behind each other's back. And she said, well, why is this a big deal to you guys? And this witch told her, she said, because we know that our words have no power against a Christian. We know that they have power. We know that our curses and stuff aren't going to hurt them. They go, well, why do you then listen to these Christians talk about each other? This person told her, because that is the only way that a Christian will fall is if the other Christians talk about each other behind each other's backs, it opens up the door for Satan to come in and rip them off. Because Christians' words are powerful. I mean, think about it for a minute. When God created the world, he didn't pull out a Black & Decker buzzsaw. He spoke words. He spoke words. And the life, the power, the ability that was inside of him was released through words. He created everything with what he said. So there's life-giving power in your words, but also your words can be very destructive. Jesus was walking down uh, the path one day, and, and back then in Jesus' time, they didn't have McDonald's and Burger King and Arby's and, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken on the side of the road. So what the farmers would do, they'd have a field that backed up to a road. They would plant certain trees next to the road that were for travelers to stop by and get some fruit and get refreshed and get some energy so they could keep going on their journey because everybody walked everywhere they went. So this was their McApple tree and their McOrange tree and their McPineapple tree, you know? So they just pull in and get a drive through order. Jesus walks up to a fig tree. He sees that there's no fruit on it and it's time for fruit to be on it. And he was hungry. He makes a statement. No man will ever eat fruit from you again. Nothing seemed to happen. Nothing seemed to change. They went on into town. They came back the next day, walking by the same tree. And Peter said this. I think this is very interesting. He said, look, Lord, the tree that you cursed is withered up from the roots. The tree that you cursed. Now, Jesus did not say, I curse you. He didn't say, I bind you. He didn't say all this stuff. He just made a basic statement. He said, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. Now, I think it'd be good for a lot of parents and teenagers to realize how powerful your words are in this vein. Because basically when you say a negative word, in New Testament times it would have been counted as a curse. Parents say to their kids, you'll never amount to anything. And in essence, it's the same thing as when Jesus said to the tree, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. And the child begins to wither and can't produce. It's amazing. You're stupid. You'll never, your grades are, you're dumb. You, you idiot. And they just pile these words on. And each time it's said, it's a curse. It's a curse. And some people spend the rest of their lives trying to crawl out from under that curse of words that has been laid on them by a parent or someone they looked up to. Now, teenagers do the same thing to their parents. Here's a very common phrase. You don't understand me. You don't understand me. You don't understand me. And you know what that does? It releases the power in your life for them to not understand you. It's powerful. And you want somebody to understand you. Well, stop saying that then. Say me. Instead, get on your knees before God and say, God, I thank you for giving me and my parents favor and good understanding with each other. And when you do that, things start to click. See? Now, some of this stuff gets passed down from generation to generation, and it's awful. Sometimes, you know, sicknesses and diseases can be passed down from one generation to another. And uh, so can other things, like alcoholism. You see a kid who grows up in a home of an alcoholic, and they say, man, I hate this. This is awful. This is a horrible life. I'll never do this to my kids. And they become an alcoholic. Why? It's a curse. But Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. We can break these curses. 
we were in Tyler, Texas. We were uh, uh, driving around one afternoon. We crossed the street, and a guy going about 60 miles an hour runs into the right rear fender of our car. Bam! Sends us spinning around. We went up in the air, spun around, took out half of this guy's yard with our rear bumper. That's how hard this guy hit us. Just swiped his yard out and landed on the street facing the entire opposite direction of where we were going. We had driven in Dallas, you know, with all the traffic and everything. Never had an accident. Went to Tyler and got ran into, you know. And uh, the guy who was driving the other car, he had just got his car out of the shop and he was driving home. The whole front end of his car was laying on the ground. He was not a happy camper, you know. And uh, I thought, well, this is ridiculous. The insurance company totaled our car, gave us the money for the car, and uh, we ended up getting a station wagon from this guy, just something to put around in until we could get a new car. We'd never had a new car. We really would believe in God for one. Uh, so I'm getting dressed one evening, and I hear this noise out front of our little house there. It sounded like, <laughs> I thought Rambo had showed up in my house, you know. I mean, things were blowing up and screeching and, and you know, just a lot of noise. I run out the front door of the house, and laying next to my station wagon is a rear fender of an old Ford truck. And that's all. A fender ran into my car, you know. It looks really weird. There's a fender, and my car's all smashed in. I go down in the street, I look down the street, and about, you know, 100 yards down, there's an old yellow Ford truck laying on its side in the middle of the road. This guy climbs out of it, and he falls down, he gets up, falls down, he gets up. I ran over there to see if he was okay, and he went, a truck hit me. He was drunk as all get out. He didn't know what was going on. Anyway, the police came and all that. And they, uh, the insurance company uh, settled out on our, and gave us the money for the station wagon, totaled it out. You know, I was getting rich. But I didn't have a car. I borrowed the pastor's car. Not a good idea. It stalled out. It was, this was in the wintertime. It stalled out on this one road. And this girl, bless her heart, she wasn't old enough to work. And she wasn't old enough to drive. And she was driving her mom's car to work. And uh, it was wintertime. It was kind of icy out. It was just getting dark. She came around the corner. There I was on the side, stalled with some flashers going. She stepped on the brake, and nothing happened. She was on ice. So she slid in the back end of the pastor's car. I thought, what the heck is this? Anyways, I'd been down to the car dealership, and I talked to the guy. I said, this is the kind of car that I would like. This is what I'm looking for. He said, well, we don't have one. We filled out papers to apply for a loan, and we came back denied. We had money for a good down payment. I mean, the insurance company was just giving us money like crazy. And uh, all this stuff was going on. I'm going, what is going on? We applied for it. They turned us down. We applied for it. They turned us down. I was praying and fasting one afternoon, and I said, God, what is the deal here? What is this with all this car stuff all of a sudden? The Spirit of God spoke to my heart, and he said, when you were born, your dad was having car trouble. And when your dad was born, his dad was having car trouble. I thought, that is the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my life. You know, Mr. Bad Wrench going from generation to generation, <laughs> ruining cars, you know. But I knew what to do. I said, well, in Jesus' name, I break this curse off of Cindy and myself of car trouble. Within two hours, the car dealership called me and said, Mr. Nordyke, we don't know where it came from. We didn't order it, but a car like the one you want just got off the truck, and it's sitting in our lot. You want to come down and look at it? I said, okay. <laughs> you know, it's like obvious what God wanted. Uh, I went down there, and within 24 hours, we had a brand new car. It was a curse. Some of you are dealing with some problems. You don't know where they came from. But we're going to pray this morning because you can be free from the curse. Why? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And you don't have to go on from generation to generation. Alcoholism, problems, sicknesses, diseases, car trouble. You don't have to have that. How many of you don't want that? See? I mean, you read Deuteronomy chapter 28. It's like, I'm going to be a slave and no one will buy me. That ain't no fun. Christ has redeemed you. You don't have to live like that. Here's what I want you to do. Put your Bibles down. I want you to stand up right where you are, everybody. I want you to lift up your hands. We're going to break the curse. We're going to break it. Yeah, stretch. Oh, some of you are going, oh, thank you, God. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to pray. Get your hands up there in the air. We're going to pray. We're going to break these curses. 
How, wave at me if you've got something you want Jesus to break off of your life. Wave at me. It's going to break this morning. Lift up your hand. Say this. In the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. He became a curse so that I don't have to live under it. I am free from the curse. So therefore, in Jesus' name, I break, I bind every curse that has come my way, either through my family or through associations or attacks of the devil on me and my family. I break the curse right now in the name of Jesus from this day forward. I will not live under that garbage. Father, I thank you that all your blessings are coming upon me and overtaking me. The little things are going to pop up in your mind. Little situations, little words that someone has said to you. Someone came up to you and called you a name or this or that or the other thing. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you can prosper. No tongue that rises against you in judgment can stand. When those things pop into your mind, say out loud with your mouth, I break those words off of me in the name of Jesus. When something comes into your mind, something that's been passed on, your grandmother had it, your mother had it, and you've got it, you say, I break that off of me in Jesus' name. It's not mine. Jesus took that. It's not mine. I'm not carrying it. Because you're free from the curse. How many of you are free from the curse? Amen. Are you excited about it? Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Come on. Praise him. Bless you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.